Does anybody know when the twelve traditions were adopted by the fellowship? 1950 at the first international and does anybody know who wrote the 12 traditions no yes they were written in 1946 and if you it, there, there's a complete history and a complete exposition of the traditions to be found not in the 12 and 12 this is an expurgated version very much watered down but the, if you if you get the language of the heart, the book which is a compilation of all of Bill's writings for the grapevine, you'll find the first section is composed almost entirely of his writings about the the uh, traditions, and it's a very very complete history uh, and, a, and and complete analysis of each of the traditions. When Bill wrote the <clears throat> traditions, he had been asked to do so because they realized that they needed to have some kind of a writing which would uh, memorialize what they had come to believe were things which were essential. For example, we know that all the way back into the writing of the big book, remember when they wrote the, the forward to the first edition, we already had the beginnings of the traditions there, didn't we? Down at the bottom of page 13, if you've got the... Yeah, it would be the same page in, in the fourth edition. We are not an organization in the conventional sense of the word. There are no fees or dues, whatever. The only requirement for membership is an honest desire to stop drinking. We are not allied with any particular faith, sect, or denomination nor do we oppose anyone. We simply wish to be helpful to those who are afflicted. So we know that even back in 1939, when that forward was written, much of what we've come to know is the traditions were already being considered as a part of the definition of Alcoholics Anonymous. In 1944, this was carried even further. In 1944, when the grapevine was organized as a non-profit organization. They wanted to get special mailing privileges with the post office department. And to do that, it was necessary for them to submit a, an application. And part of the application was to uh, detail what the, this, this new uh, non-profit organization was all about, what they, especially where they got their money and what kind of uh, uh, program were they running, and what was what were they pro uh, what were they professing? And so they wrote back, and what they wrote back to post office department is what we now call the definition of AA, which is read at every meeting. <clears throat> so remember, remembering what that is, you'll see even more of the traditions already in place in 1944. So when Bill set out to write the, the traditions, <coughs> we already had a pretty firm basis for many of them that had already been worked out and decided upon. One thing that was clear, though, and a lot of people wanted to write out some rules, rules and regulations, and he said, no, I don't think that's a good idea. We're not going to be able to enforce any of this stuff. We don't have a police force. We don't have any way to discipline anybody so we're going and Bill called these points of tradition when he first wrote them in 1946 is when these were put together and he also called he, you see they also had um, some history to fall back on not AA history but history from before you probably have heard about an outfit called the Washingtonians the Washingtonians had been a, uh, a group that formed in the 1800s, I think around 1830. It was kind of funny the way it happened. There were six guys sitting around getting drunk one night. They decided to get sober. So they said, okay, well, good. Well, let's just we'll form a sober group. And so they ended up calling themselves the Washingtonians. Nobody knows for sure why. But 
they decided that the way that this should work is that one one alcoholic would work with another, which was a great idea. The problem is they didn't understand that the basis for the organization had to be self-sacrifice and humility and that unity required of them that they not advertise themselves nor promote themselves. So they went just the opposite way. They began by by taking credit for everything, by using their last name and, and their speeches and their writings. And uh, But they very rapidly acquired a whole bunch of followers. As a matter of fact, within six years, the Washingtonians had something like 100,000 members. Then they made the fatal two fatal mistakes. One was that they adopted the cause of of uh, slavery as uh, their cause. They became uh, secessionists. And they also adopted as a part of their whole platform the cause of the Prohibition Party, which was a, a political party in those days. So now they had thrown the full, full force and effect of the Washingtonians behind the slavery issue and behind... Uh, prohibition. As a result of that, they lost whatever credibility they'd already achieved, and they collapsed. And the Washingtonians collapsed very quickly. They had their their complete run was only about six years. But something happened there that was quite instructive, and that is that their their major premise was not a bad one. That one alcoholic working with another would be would be the way to have to, uh, to effective recovery, and also they had reliance upon a higher power. So our guys learned from this, and so you can see that the the traditions that deal with taking on outside um, issues or lending the name of AA to any outside organization or cause. They had good. They had a good history to fall back on. It showed them that this would never work. And so, in 1946, Bill wrote the traditions, and uh, they first came out as 12 points of tradition, basically in the form that we see in the back of the book called the long form. And from there, Bill wrote extensively and continued to submit articles to Grapevine, which were published. And wherever he went, he spoke about the traditions. And it got to a point where when they'd ask him to speak in, in 48 and 49, they'd say, Bill, please come and speak, but don't even mention those damn traditions. We're getting sick of hearing about it. In 1950, at the first international, that's when the traditions were submitted to the entire membership for adoption, and they were submitted in what we call the short form. And they were adopted in 1950 as, a, as those spiritual principles which guide our groups and guide our fellowship. And it's clear that these traditions are spiritual principles. It's also clear that the failure of our groups to study the traditions in any kind of depth is a, is a significant omission because as we found the last time we went through these together, the traditions apply equally to us as individuals. In our individual recovery, each of these traditions has something to teach us about how we live our lives and how we approach uh, our spiritual fitness, how we remain spiritually fit, and, it, and instruct us as to some of the things that we ought not to do and some of the things that we should do. Now the first tradition that the that the uh, the common welfare has to come first, and that our personal recovery and sobriety depends upon the unity of the fellowship. It's pretty strong language, and yet it's literally so. They they had learned by the time this was written and by the way this was this this tradition was was written by Bill it had not been something that was an oral tradition up till that time but he he felt <clears throat> that
that he had to bookend the other traditions with the first and the twelfth tradition. And he wrote about that. First and twelfth tradition basically support each other, but they bookend the rest of the tradition. And what we're looking at is that because we are saying that our uh, common welfare should come first, what we're really saying is that each individual within the fellowship sublimates and subordinates his own or her own desire for ap- for acclaim and for notoriety and for uh, ego building, power driving, ego enhancement sublimates all of those natural human tendencies to the good of the fellowship. And one of the, and one of the most important ways we do that is by omitting our last name. So when we look at anonymity as the spiritual foundation of all of our traditions, and we look at our common welfare should come first, then we see how these two traditions bookend the rest of the traditions. Because the idea here is humility and self-sacrifice... <coughs> Which, which will assure the unity of the fellowship because our personal recovery depends upon it. It's exactly the same thing as Bill often liked to use the, the analogy of a bunch of people uh, in a lifeboat trying to survive. And each person within that lifeboat, even though they may never have known each other before and they come from every background and some have been sitting at the cattle's captain's table and some are in steerage. And yet here they are in this lifeboat and they have to pull together in order to survive. And it's the same idea with, with uh, AA. That we are here precisely because our lives are in grave danger. And we each of us have exactly the same problem. It may have manifest itself in different ways, but ultimately... We have the same problem, that we're spiritually bankrupt. And in order for us to recover, we have to find a power greater than ourselves and surrender to that power. Most importantly, to do that power's will. And to do that, we need the unity that each of us can help to bring to the fellowship and to our groups. There are today groups all over the place, one right here close in this town, where some individuals are doing everything they possibly can to disrupt the unity of the group making people pick sides it's a a shame to see that happening because that's the way you destroy a group I know that there are three groups that, that existed in North Miami which no longer exist they were big groups had 100, 150 people at meetings sometimes they no longer exist they fell into the clutches of a cabal of, of powers that be, people who, who ran the thing to their own specifications. And, and almost overnight, all of these groups collapsed. It just doesn't work that way. They broke every tradition in the book. A, Alcoholics Anonymous deals with a disease of alcoholism. Alcoholism is a self-cleaning oven. That's why we don't have to be afraid. We don't have to be afraid of anything. We don't have to worry about those strange alcoholics who wander in off the street, who may have absolutely no alcohol to speak of in their in their story, and yet they're seeking help from us. And they say to us, if you don't help me, I'm going to die. What are we going to do? Are we going to turn them away? This was settled all the way back when, when Tradition 3 was was being decided upon. The answer was, what would the Master say? The answer was simple and was obvious. We didn't have the right to turn somebody away who needed our help. And so, what we're looking at here then are 12 principles stated as traditions which guide our, our, uh, our fellowship and our groups, but which, and this is so important to apply each and every one of them applies directly to us as well. And as we go through this, this uh, cycle of the traditions together, we're going to try to point that out to see how we personally are affected by these traditions as, as we would naturally be. If we're dealing with spiritual principles here, and we are, then they apply equally to us in our individual lives as they do to the group 
and to the fellowship as a whole. Now, when we look at the traditions, we find that there are no AA police, even though I continually joke about it, that there are no rules which are to be enforced, that nobody can be denied membership, the only requirement being that we have a desire to stop drinking. Nobody can tell us we don't. We, there is nothing in our traditions which requires of us that we identify ourselves as an alcoholic. only thing we're required to do, according to traditions, is identify ourselves as a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And any, anyone that you know, or if you're personally having a problem with this, my name is Jim, I'm an alcoholic, forget it, you don't have to say that. I'm a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, and that's backed up in the big book. You are a member when you say you are. We have no chiefs. We're all Indians. And every once in a while an Indian consents to be a trusted servant who operates at the will of the group or the will of the fellowship. And this business of trusted servant goes all the way to the top. I know I was a delegate in New York for a couple of years. There's no difference there. It's the same thing. You'd think when you'd go up to New York to be a delegate, you'd have all kinds of power, could be making all these great decisions which would affect the whole fellowship and everybody would have to pay attention. B.S. Mostly a debating society. Sit around and make some decisions here and there. None of which can be enforced as far as the individual groups are concerned. Each group is autonomous can conduct its own business the way it feels like. Even if it's interfering with other groups or AA as a whole, it cannot be disciplined. It cannot be drummed out. It cannot be stricken from the rolls. Because you see, the moment that we get into any of that police activity, we immediately are going to have to find people to be policemen. And then we're going to have to find people to be judges. And then those people are going to have to be judging other people. How the hell do we do that? If we were, if we just aren't the Elks, the Moose, the Rotarians, Kiwanis, or the Masons, we are not a military or paramilitary organization. We have no police. We have one thing: we're all alcoholics, and alcoholism is the great teacher and the great leveler and the great discipliner. That's all we have to know. That's why the traditions were were developed with that sole thing in mind. We don't have to be afraid. So long as the fellowship and the group stick with the traditions, we'll last forever. This fellowship has the potential to go on till there is no more world left. And there is no other organization in the whole world that has that. It means this, that, 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 that we can throw a pebble into that infinite still pond and expect the ripples to go on forever. It's amazing. We have found the formula for an, an organization of human beings <coughs> which has the, the capability and the potential to last forever. And nobody can make any rules about it. It all depends upon one thing, that when we come in here we're alcoholics, faced with an alcoholic death, and that we all agree on a common method of recovery, which is to find and surrender to a higher power. So, okay, that's enough for me. Who'd like to share? <coughs> Dennis, how about you? Do you find this interesting, Janice? Yes, I do. I always find it interesting to know about the program that saved my life. That's any, any bit of information. What, what surprises you the most about the traditions? Whatever well, they, that uh, when they were made, that it was God speaking 
through that person to make them. So this mm -hmm. thing will last forever. Mm -hmm. But I believe, like, when you sit there and, and, and say not to give you the credit because that's working through you, it's true. Sure. Yeah. It's, it's a great thing. That they're, they're set there perfectly for a great life so that we will last forever. Do you know what Bill said about all this? He said, nobody invented AA. It just grew by the grace of God. So he knew what was happening. Anything else you'd like to share with us? Um, I haven't done much work with the uh, traditions. I choose to work on my steps today. Um, I want to keep my traditions, but... Um, I did go to a tradition meeting once uh, in the other room here. It was on the seventh tradition. And I kept learning that there was a, a bit of, you know, there were some problems in the beginning to get this thing started financially. And um, that's kind of when they decided, you know, not to take any contributions from the outside because uh, it was the Rockefeller kind of put up some money, gives money to Bill, I think it was. And um, that's how we kind of first started the thing out uh, paying the rent and things like that. And no, it was, that was for um, publication of the big book. Yeah, that's, okay, yeah, that's right. <laughs> but Rockefeller said, you guys shouldn't be asking other people for money. Right. And that's a big mistake, he said. And then they, they, through experience, learned that to depend on ourselves. Yep. It's worked so far. If I got a dollar for a Coke, I sure got another Yep. What do you think about this idea of having this uh, prudent, prudent reserve? That's a trick question. <laughs> well, of course, it's a good idea. Like having a, Why? Like having investments. Huh? Like, a, like having an insurance policy. Uh, insurance against what? Against our existence. <laughs> Okay, so we are self-supporting to our own contributions, right? Correct. When would we ever need a, a prudent reserve? What? When we stop supporting ourselves, right? Which, which sometimes happens a couple times. The program is not and then that, you know, we left our money. Uh -huh. So you always know, want to cover it knowing that it's the welfare of the whole group. So the other members can still have a meeting, and we'll have the money to pay rent. Yeah. And why would, if we've been able to pay rent up to now, why would we ever not be able to pay? Where is our trust in God? Where is, where is it that we have fallen down on our obligation to be the support of our own group? Where is the fear? I hear people say, well, we might go have to go for two or three months without any income, and therefore we we couldn't pay the rent. What does that mean? Stop having meetings? Well, it would be Everybody it goes on vacation, or what? It wouldn't be That's but right. That. Exactly. You see, this whole thing is a product of fear, isn't it? What is the fear that we are not going to be capable of being self-supporting to our own contribution? Is that the fear? I think it's more of responsibility than fear. Okay. What happens when a group accumulates a whole bunch of money as a prudent reserve? Anybody ever watch that dynamic? Okay. You you're talking about enough to pay a month's rent or something? One or two, perhaps. Yeah. Okay. No, well no other person is that there's a minimum uh, contribution from one person to the program per year of so like two thousand dollars or something. Well that's yeah, well that's that's for New York. 
but uh, that's never nobody pays any attention to. It. They try to get uh, get the normal contribution up to two dollars, and nobody pays attention to that either, except you know maybe for a month or so. I mean, it's it, all this stuff is beside the point. If we're going to trust God, and if we, we must, and we're going to trust that our that our that our group is performing a viable function for its members, it's carrying the message, and that people are concerned that the group stay together, then one way or another they'll find a way to do it. See, it's the, the when that does not happen, then the group falls apart, and they, and when a group dies, it dies for very good reasons. Somewhere along the line, it stopped being effective in carrying the message. And people may not really understand why it is they're dissatisfied, but suddenly they realize they're not going to meetings there anymore. They find other groups. So, um, I don't suppose there'd be any objection to having a couple of months of rent put aside or something. In this group, however, whatever money we have left over, we donate to New York and do the intergroup and to district and to area. And we split it up in accordance with the, the traditional percentages. And one way or another, we always have money to pay the rent. This month, we're a little bit short. We won't be able to make too much of a contribution, but we still make a contribution. Because, you see, the moment that we stop bringing in enough money to pay the, the, the rent here, which is not that much, 125 a month, we can... When, when we're not able to do that, then this this group has lost all of its punch. And if it, if we can't if we can't even make that a little about a mu- amount of rent, then we stop performing a function. And we can go someplace else where we can have a we can we can go into a basement in a in a, in a church for twenty bucks a month, continue to have our meetings. Because there's, there's no way that a group was ever put out of business just because it can't make rent. A group is not dependent upon the place it meets. It's dependent upon the unity of the group. You always find a way to stay together if that's what we want to do. I'm going to move the, the workshop that's up at Pompano Beach Club. I'm going to move it down here because it's, it's just not working. Up there. They don't support it. And so move it here and see if it has support here. Probably will. If it doesn't, we'll close it down. You know, if nobody wants it, then there'd be no point in continuing to do it. Having a couple months rent put aside, I can see how that'd be okay. The, 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 the problem is we don't want to have a bunch of money sitting around to argue over. That's deadly. Chris, what do you think of what do you think is going on here? What's no, as far as having a large reserve, I totally agree with the fact that when you start talking you know, large numbers of money, the larger that number gets, the more somebody feels that they have to be in control you know, of that money. And you know, the fear of financial <coughs> security you know, is a direct result of that, I think. As far as the first edition, I believe very strongly in unity of A because from what I'm learning in the short time that I've been in the program is that you know, personalities, you know, if you put one particular person, you know, in a situation where ridicule and various things can happen. For instance, if that person goes out, it makes the whole program look bad. Sure. Versus, you know, the whole group, you know, if the group, you know, is maintaining the sobriety and continuing to help somebody, one person goes out, the group is a group collapse. Right. You know, and that's that's what the first tradition means to me. Okay. Good. Thank you, Chris. Anybody else? Yes, Dennis. Um, I don't know what tradition if this pertains to tradition one or not, but um, in my hometown, where I think there was a little bit of a discussion that about 9 11. The what? 9 11. And what happened in New York City to the World Trade Center. And um, rumor had it that there was a whole bunch of people who came together. Um, 
that we are responsible. Not just like you were saying earlier, two alcoholics, especially alcoholics. Uh huh. But they came together and they they came up with money. I think if their program was going to be falling apart, they come up with money, you know, fix it. On that aspect, but somebody was saying that they, should, you know, that that's not their business. But that is our business. <laughs> Sure. Helping, helping other people is our business. That's what we do. And that, that was absolutely great that they showed up with truck, truck full of uh, <coughs> food and, and stuff in the trucks and, and did all that volunteer work. Sure. That, that was great. That we, we didn't do it for any publicity or to look good or anything else. No AA name was mentioned on the news for doing that. But you see that when people were talking and you heard their words and they were being interviewed, they were, they were part of our fellowship. Yeah. And they were there. And that's a really good feeling. Yeah, you're right. You know, right. said that it's just that it's sad, but you know, that's not our business. That's not what it is. That's, that's just one of the, one more thing I just thought about. Okay. Yeah, I just agree with you, too. I just agree with that. I think that's another issue. And I think one of the traditions mentioned, uh, that's another issue. What's what? It has nothing to do with it. Well, then technically, I guess you're right, and uh, that uh, this is an out- outside issue. On the other hand, we can do anything we want to do as individuals. <coughs> I don't know whether Dennis is saying that they were identifying themselves as members of AA and the members of a group. But the group gave the money to the... No, no, that, that, no. I have no idea where the money came from, but they came up with the money. Somehow, some way they showed up with a, with a semi-full food. Well, is, if they simply uh, identified themselves as alcoholics... They, they, they didn't even identify themselves. It was just in their words and you could tell that they were... Oh, okay. Well, then the, I don't think there's any violation of tradition there, do you? doesn't look like it. We, we, I don't think any AA group would be uh, go so far away from tradition just to go down there and proclaim themselves as, the, you know, that they were such wonderful... Uh, providers of food and stuff. It went something like this. One guy said, uh, I've done enough, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a recovered addict, or I'm a recovered addict, I've done enough uh, harm in my life to other people, it's time for me to start paying back a little bit, that's what he said. Okay. So you need bank. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, that, that, that pretty yeah. obviously was not a group function then. No, it wasn't a group function, okay. but you could tell that that's they ate one or the other. Under that, I am responsible. Sure. Okay, who's next? I, I think you said it earlier. It, if a person comes to these doors and they have problems that are life threatening other than alcohol, this is what we do. We shut the door on and say you can't come in. I mean, is this God's will? That, that's, to me, this is the whole big thing for me that I got out of this program. And I share it all the meetings. Well, that this was a spiritual awakening for me. The whole program, yeah. the steps, the traditions, they all intertwine. And, and I understand it's Alcoholics Anonymous, but... Well, that issue was solved way back in the early days of the fellowship. And we just, we've forgotten that it's, it's here, though. You know, it's right here in the book. Let's take a look at it. It'll only take a second. Right on page 141. The newcomer appeared at one of these groups, knocked on the door, and asked to be let in. <clears throat> he talked frankly with that group's oldest member. He soon proved that his was a desperate case, and above all, he wanted to get well. But he asked, will you let me join your group? Since I'm the victim of another addiction, even worse stigmatized in alcoholism, you may not want me among you. Or will you? There was the dilemma. What should the group do? The oldest member summoned, summoned two others and in confidence laid the explosive facts in their laps. Said he, well, what about it? If we turn this man away, he'll soon die. If we allow him in, only God knows what trouble he'll brew. What shall the answer be, yes or no? 
uh, first the elders to look only at the objections. We deal, they said, with alcoholics only. Shouldn't we sacrifice this one for the sake of the many? Wow. So went the discussion until the newcomer's fate hung in the balance. Then one of the three spoke in a very different voice. What are we really afraid of, he said, is our reputation. We are much more afraid of what people might say than the trouble this strange alcoholic might bring. As we've been talking, five short words have been running through my mind. Something keeps repeating to me, what would the Master do? And another word was said, what more indeed could be said. Overjoyed, the newcomer plunged into the 12-step work. Tirelessly, he laid A's message before scores of people. Since this was a very early group, those scores have now multiplied themselves into thousands. Never did he trouble anyone with his other difficulty. AA had taken his first step in the formation of Tradition 3. And I believe that. I believe that that's that we forget that clear back there in the first year of, of the formation of this fellowship, that question was already decided. And when we get involved in this question of drugs, we forget too that there's there's something so important for us to keep in mind that. Page 22. If he can afford it, he may have liquor concealed all over his house to be certain no one gets his entire supply away from him to throw down the waste pack pipe. As matters grow worse, he begins to use a combination of high-powered sedative and liquor to quiet his nerves. Bye, darling. See you later. Good night. Yeah. to quiet his nerves so he can work. Then comes the day when he simply cannot make it and gets drunk all over again. Perhaps he goes to a doctor who gives him morphine or some sedative with which to taper off. Then he begins to appear at hospitals and sanitariums. Now this business of, of drug use goes all the way back into the formation of fellowship. There is no way to separate the two. And today, the fact is that people walk in the door, almost all have some drugs in their story. Almost all. And so, we have to stop counting andas and stop worrying about it. The 12 steps work for everybody. The real problem with somebody who is, a, who is strictly an addict is how, how if, we're, if we're not, how do we 12 step them? But once they have worked their first step, everything else works exactly the same. There's no difference. And we don't, AA doesn't have the exclusive rights to the 12 steps. By no means. These are universal spiritual principles which were granted to us so that we can recover. We have no right to keep them to ourselves. It's like you were saying to me. <coughs> For a step meeting here, uh, people, the group conscious, tradition one, I think a lot of people forget that too. They turn it into their own little crusade on keeping people on it. Yeah. No, I, I'm sorry. <clears throat> you know, you read and you follow through. When you're hurting and you first come in, <clears throat> my belief is that somewhere along the way that human solution steps into everybody's life when they have sobriety. I've seen it happen in other rooms. They get, they lose sight of what this is all about. Right. <clears throat> and you talk about money, you talk about whatever you want, and in some respects people come in and the attitude be, I got mine, you get yours. Yep. You know, and, and you lose sight of that, and you scare. The fright is there that when you try to participate, am I qualified enough? Do I understand enough? Instead of enlightening and helping, there's criticism. Yep. That, you see, 
When, when I listen to you speak sometimes, it, 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 it's beautiful the way you bring it out. I understand it. But yet you turn around and you, you confront yourself and you go somewhere else and you don't listen to that intermingling of all what the book represents, like the Bible does. There's a foundation. Why, in God's name, do we insist the human factor has to come in and project a different picture and take away from here? That dynasty has to be. When you go somewhere, you watch and you see, if you extend your hand, I've been to extend my hand, shake my hand today, and two weeks from today, the same man will look me right in the face, like I didn't even exist. Now, I take the position, well, I extended my hand to him. If he doesn't want to extend it back to me, fine. Sure. There's no resentment to it. Uh, let it go. Exactly. You know, but then you sit back and you say, well, if I have the, re the sense or the resources to accept that type of an, a an, a an answer, what happens to the person that's not that thin skin, that thick skin, I should say, that takes a resentment to that you may scare? We, that you, in fact, always seems to interject and get into what we're, what we're trying to accomplish. I don't know, I, I do you know why. The insecurity, you can't give away what you don't have. If they don't have the spirituality, all they can <coughs> cling to yeah, but what look, they've heard. In the I, I understand, but look, look at the person that comes walking through the front door and idolizes the person. I'll take you, for example. Look at the two groups I'm talking to you now. I sit down and listen to you share somebody if I hear somebody like this. You know, how much time do you have? That's eight years. I have a week. To me, you're my guru. That's human nature. You know, I mean, that's what I'm saying. You in fact are, so now if you don't project properly to me or scare me some way, I'm gonna back up and say, Wow. You know, I'm listening to you share. I, like you said, that hard love. Go to me as the guy turns around and says they got 10 years sobriety, 15 years sobriety. Last night I'm home, I smacked the shit out of my wife and my kids. But I haven't had a drink. And, and some people say, well, as long as he's sober, that's acceptable. There's the human factor again, the human answers again. He doesn't have the spirituality. He has no, he hasn't accepted what has to be there. But you can see that now. Oh, I can see that now, right. because my my point was all the time, I've been trying this program because Dominic has been trying to do it Dominic's way for so many years, and it hasn't worked that bad. A year and a half out of here. I finally get to the point that this is my only reason. I have to give up and turn, turn it over. And, and now this is where I'm at. And now I'm starting to see the fallacy and what is out there. But I have these 10 years of getting thin skin, thick skin from listening from the beginning from all the folks you At the same time, you still can't run them off. No. What you have to do is be vocal and speak the spirit, speak of the spirituality right. and not be afraid to speak of it. Of course. You have to have that message. Right. And, and in so many meetings, we don't have that message. Well, no, exactly. no, you don't. Know, right. We're afraid of some shit to scare off the newcomer. I mean, this first tradition, um, I, I hear, for me, I, I tell people, the fellowship got me sober. Because if I didn't feel accepted in the rooms as a human being, I wouldn't have come in here. And for this, this for me, this, this first tradition, I mean, I have to be sure there is a fellowship. Or there's never going to be a place for me to go. Because for me, I couldn't have gotten sober reading this book by myself. I had to come to hear you. I had to come. The sponsor I picked is a big book hunter. And I... Prayed on it, and I made that choice because of it. Because I knew I was looking for it to come out on video. Well, that tradition is literally true. Our personal recovery depends upon the unity of the fellowship. Exactly. That's literally so. Yeah. And, well, and that's the people I first learned about the traditions from say that the steps point to 12, and actually the traditions point to 1. And I like the way you presented it, they're bookended, bookended actually. Yeah. You know? Sure. Yeah, cool. <laughs> we're, we, we are bookended by humility and unity. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Tom, did you have something you wanted to add? Yeah, I mean, it's not on the floor. <coughs> Not I mean, you were saying something about a, a man who said that 15 years and then goes home and beats his wife and abuses his kids. You know he's not working the tradition. Because if you work the tradition in AA, you would know how to live life outside of AA and how to live a family life. 
of the unity of the family. And that's what I think, eh? And the guys doing that stuff over at, in New York, you know, that's, they're trying to carry the message. You know, and they're not trying to take credit for what they're just doing their thing. And, and, and our common welfare should come first. Well, that's the way it should be in a family. Actually, that should be the way in, in all human, the human race. But it's not. But it's starting with the AA and then it's a little bigger up in New York. Uh, it's still going to fact that you're still going to have people that are trying to control. They lost sight of that. You get into a meeting and you, they lose all perspective of why they're there. They forgot how it hurts. Well, when they came in the door with tears in their eyes, crying for someone to help them. Now I got mine. Now you have to try and get yours. That's why you, the way you were dictating. People say, well, I'll tell you when to start the steps. I'll tell you when to do this. I'll tell you when to do that. They lost the perspective of the hurt that they had. When I first came through the front door, I would have pissed the donkey's ass if that would have got me sober. But they lose all of that. Somewhere along the way, that human factor comes in. And why, I don't understand Need to soft the way. Yes, exactly. Exactly. That's why some of these meetings <coughs> turn into zoos. That's right. Yeah. Personalities, egos, and they forget all about what this thing is all like about. Like they had a meeting just recently. She would have a open, their wealth on people. An open or closed meeting with children, should they be allowed in? How should, should this happen? Should that happen? Uh, do we have to have this? Do we have to have that? And it has nothing to do with the book. That's right. Well, it's contrary to the book. The book says that the, the, uh, that this fellowship should be open to all people. I mean, There's no, you know, it tells us that, that the, the realm of the Spirit is broad, roomy, all inclusive, never explicit or forbidding. It is open, we believe, to all people. And every time we break that, that's, that's, a, that, that's God's will. And every time we, we set up these exclusive meetings, men's, women's, doctors, lawyers, closed meetings, you can't have... Why would, why would you keep a little kid from being in a meeting if, if the kid is quiet? Well, he's not an alcoholic. Well, what's that mean? He's going to go rat you out at kindergarten? I mean, what's the point here? Yeah, I know. Uh, and it's, it, you know, so you're dead right. But the people who fall back into the human solution don't stay sober anyway. So you, you're going to be waving bye-bye to them pretty soon. We can pretty much relax about them. The, the, prob the problem is they screwed up the, the newcomer quite a bit. And that's why... That's why we spend a lot of time trying to keep the record straight. That's why I do a sponsorship workshop. I've been doing it for 14 years now. Because in that, Tom knows, when that, in that workshop, three or four or five people every cycle will get it. But they go out and they're carrying the message then. And they know how to do it because we, we learn how to teach the steps and how to teach the big book. Maybe you have this workshop. Is that workshop here? Yeah, we're going to start it here in about four weeks. Mm -hmm. I'm doing it in Pompano Beach right now, but we're almost finished with this cycle. We've, we've done it three times there now. It's a cycle is about 35 weeks. What time? Uh, afternoon, the afternoon on Saturday. It'll be at 1 or 1.30 here. Okay, guys, let's close her down. <laughs> Yours truly is cool. scared our young lady away. <laughs> anyway, let's let this circle represent the unity of our fellowship. Have a moment of silence for those who are still suffering. And we'll say the Lord's Prayer together. And remember, we don't say anything after we say Amen. Thank you, Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Okay.
Okay, guys. Thanks for being here. Thanks for 12-stepping me.